Hi, welcome to part four of our series of screencasts explaining the OAuth 2 protocol. You've just seen a demo of a user granting an access token allowing Parsley.com to access her bank balances at Acme Bank. Now we'll walk through this process step by step. Note that we're simply going to show you the how of this process and not the why. This is simply a walkthrough of how the mechanics of token granting might be implemented as defined in the web server flow from the OAuth 2 draft. There are other token granting flows, this is the web server flow. So to start, Mary clicks the Add Acme Bank Gadget button at her Parsley dashboard. The browser sends a request to the Parsley server asking for this gadget and for its data. The server, however, can't find an Acme Bank access token for Mary, so it's not able to immediately present the gadget. Instead, it sends along to her browser the data needed to begin the token granting process. This data includes Parsley's OAuth client ID that we have previously discussed, the authorized URL, which is the location of the Acme Bank page where Mary will grant the access, and a redirect URL. The redirect URL is essentially a callback to Parsley.com, but don't worry about that right now as we'll see it in greater depth soon enough. Uh, and also note that the spec refers to it as redirect URI. Uh, it's gonna, I'm going to call it redirect URL to make this discussion a little easier. So the browser receives this information. The uh, Parsley dashboard page has some JavaScript code that was written just for this scenario of no token found, and it is able to open a pop-up window. Uh, this new window will then get the page located at the Acme Bank authorized URL. This page is the token granting authorization form. Notice that the client ID and redirect URI need to be sent along in this request. Uh, but we got a little problem here. Acme Bank does not recognize from whom this request is coming. There's been no session established between Mary's browser and Acme Bank. So Mary is presented with the standard Acme Bank login screen. And so Mary enters her username and password to establish a new session. Uh, notice that this is the only place that Mary enters her username and password for Acme Bank. It's on an Acme page sending data to an Acme server. So now that Acme knows it's Mary, it responds to her original request for the access token granting authorization form. Uh, and note that the client ID and redirect URI are still along for the ride here. They're being rendered as hidden fields on the authorization form. Uh, Mary grants authorization. Again, the client ID and redirect URI, identifying this as a Parsley request, are still along for the ride, making their way back to the server. At this point, Acme Bank does not immediately generate the access token. Instead, it creates an authorization code. What this code represents is that Mary has authorized Parsley to request her access token from Acme Bank. We're still a few steps away from actual uh, token granting. So now we'll finally use that redirect URL. Remember that this sequence began with Mary's pressing the Authorize button back in her browser. Acme Bank still has not responded to that request, but now it responds with an HTTP redirect code. The redirect URL that is sent along is built up from the base redirect URI parameter that we've been seeing all along. This redirect URL is a callback allowing Mary's browser to serve as a vehicle for Acme getting data back over to Parsley.com. Here the newly granted authorization code will be passed along. So, the browser receives the redirect response and appropriately attempts to get that URL from Parsley. What's really happening is that Mary is letting Parsley know that she's authorized the token grant and passing along the corresponding authorization code. Now, Parsley, seeing Mary has passed along the authorization code, can now acquire the access token. Parsley makes the token request passing along the client ID and the authorization code. Note that here the client secret is passed along as well, as that will be needed to verify the authorized code. Acme recognizes the authorized code and creates Mary's access token. The authorization code is revoked at this point. Acme returns the newly created access token with expiration date uh, to Parsley in the form of JSON. Parsley now has Mary's access token, granting them the privilege of accessing Mary's account balances over at Acme. Parsley passes the success along back to the browser and we're all good. Now, the Parsley dashboard knows a token exists for Mary and it makes another request to populate the gadget. Once Parsley has Mary's access token, it can access her data for dashboard population. The mechanics here are very simple. Parsley simply passes along the token as an HTTP authorization header. Acme recognizes the token is valid and returns the data. Parsley can then correctly render Mary's dashboard. One very important final note before we wrap up. All of the message passing that we just demonstrated must take place over SSL. This is an important distinction between OAuth 2 and 1. 
OAuth 2 dropped request signatures in favor of simplifying life for client developers. The implication of this is that OAuth 2.0 traffic must be over SSL lest secrets and tokens be easily compromised. And thus ends our series of screencasts explaining OAuth 2.0. We hope this all made sense. Uh, we'd love to hear about any feedback or corrections. This has been presented by ThoughtWorks Studios, makers of Mingle, Go, and Twist. We are currently enabling all of our products with OAuth 2.0, both for third-party API access, but also for purposes of integration between our own applications, where we'll be using OAuth 2 in conjunction with a gadget framework, and also we've published a uh, provider plugin for Rails applications over on GitHub. Thanks for your time.